Right, hello. Um, my name's Tim Oates. Um, I'm Group Director of Research Assessment and Development at Cambridge Assessment. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great pleasure today to, um, to, to welcome you all to this live event. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks to Penelope Woodham and, and to, to other colleagues like Stuart and Jonathan. We've all been grappling with the technology for the last 20 minutes, so it might appear seamless to you, but there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to make it work, and it does appear to be working, which is great. We've got over 400 people registered and watching, which is fantastic, from 59 countries. And that's good. I mean, that's exactly what the Cambridge Assessment Network is about. It's about sharing. Um, the highest quality knowledge about curriculum and assessment around the world. Um, so we're all set up, we're ready to go, and Nuno is waiting and present, which is great. Um, and I'd like to welcome Nuno. Um, he's he's a, an old colleague of mine um, and, and, and a very distinguished one. Um, Nuno is, is an academic who uh, works in Lisbon, but has worked in a number of countries, including the States, has a wide experience of different education systems. He was Minister for Education in Portugal from June 2011 to 2015, and those dates are important. I'll turn to those dates in a moment. Time is, is quite an important part of this presentation today. Um, goodness me, when you Google uh, Nunu and look at the accolades and awards that he's got, the European Prize 2003, a European Science Award in 2008. It's a long, long list, which I'm not going to go through, but it is a very long list. Um, amusingly, Nunu, I was on top of a mountain in Switzerland in the summer talking to a professional downhill mountain biker from Portugal, and I said, oh, you know, I, I work with uh, Nunu Crato. And he said, ah, that was that good guy who was the Minister of Education. So you're, you're, you, you penetrated deeply into Portuguese society. This is a very good thing. What's important as well for, for perhaps for, for people in different countries to understand that you were an independent, you weren't party affiliated. Um, uh, that, that's unusual, of course, in some political systems for a minister to be independent. Uh, but I think that's quite an important part of, of, your, of your life story. The idea of providing a really secure and independent evidence base to public policy, something we'll pick up. Um, so I've worked with you on establishing a valid evidence base regarding curriculum assessment policy, um, and we, you've, you've convened groups to achieve that across a number of nations. We've worked together on textbook policy and textbook practice, curriculum theory, and, and also on the management of public policy. Most recently, we've worked together on interpreting PISA results. And, and uh, you, you've proven again to be personally very effective in marshalling experts across more than 10 countries uh, to write a country by country interpretation of uh, the 2018 PISA results, which I know that we'll be looking at today. Um, and and why, why are the dates important? Well, the dates are important, 2011 to 2015, because you and I have discussed greatly the, the importance of understanding time lags in looking at the relationship between public policy and in education and when its effects actually emerge in the big transnational surveys. And um, I've done a lot of background work and presented through the lecture series of the network, the extent to which Finland has been systematically misinterpreted because people have not looked at time lags effectively. They've associated uh, the wrong policy with certain outcomes. And that's led to quite a lot of confusion and, and quite a lot of, of flawed policy making around the world and some very, very odd narratives and odd discussions about what comprises effective policy. So I know that you're going to deal with this, looking at the actions which were taken in Portugal at a particular time and when the impact of that policy emerges in the data. There was much discussion by OECD of Finland being a great success. Uh, Poland was then considered to be a huge success. Um, Portugal was mentioned and uh, now Estonia is seen as, as one, of the, one of the big success stories. But, uh, but throughout those, those um, countries being championed by OECD, I think there has been confusion about which policy 
has resulted in which outcome. Uh, and we're seeing that quite tangibly now in terms of the, the problems associated with interpreting the declining standards in Scotland. So it's a huge pleasure to invite you today, Nunu, and, and for you to go through a narrative of public policy actions taken in Portugal and how we should interpret them uh, in the in the assessment and other data associated with the Portuguese system. So welcome, Nunu. Well, thank you very much, Tim. You are too kind. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and uh, I Obviously, um, I'm very thankful to you and to your team for organizing this event and uh, to you to inv for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here and um, I'll try to, in uh, about half an hour or shorter than that, give you my take on what happened in Portugal and how we can improve education. So my uh, title, the title of this short talk is um, concentrates on curricula, assessment, focus on all students and how that can improve education. Um, you have referred to it, but I have good news for you. The book that in which you and I uh, collaborated, this book is out today. So it's a <laughs> it's a, a funny, a funny thing that uh, I just received the news from from the publisher that saying that the book is out and it's open access. So if you want to download the book or everybody who wants to download the book will have a wonderful chapter by Tim and an, another chapter by me and other other countries, Estonia, Finland, uh, United States and so on. Uh, we were very, very lucky to get an incredible um, amount, an incredible uh, team of um, experts to describe the results in these 10 countries. And if you want to dig in, in what I think about what happened in, in Portugal. There is a chapter in this book, which is also uh, free to download, it's open access. And um, that chapter that I wrote describes this in greater detail, but I'm going to update a couple of things and um, and um, go to do a re, uh, just a, a summary of the events. Well, it's true that PISA and Teams, and uh, I, I look at Teams as uh, well as I look at PISA because Teams has more tied to the curriculum, is more curriculum sensitive, and um, the results are exactly the results for the period that we are considering. And uh, they called the international attention over Portugal. I have here a couple of funny, funny um, clippings from newspapers. It gives me much pleasure to see here our Spanish friends, you know, about this rivalry, this friendly rivalry uh, between Portuguese and Spanish. Well, saying looking up to Portugal and this gives me great pleasure. Uh, you of course you recognize that gentleman on the right and um, also another another Spanish speaking um, newspaper talking about Portugal. Even the economists talked about Portugal and stressed the right things I think and Brazil well Brazil they were elated with the results in Portugal. They invited me many times to go there and to explain what we have done. What we have done I think it's the essential things. It's nothing magic. It's the essential things. Look at uh, the results and you, if you see the results, you see that the results have increased up to 2015 with some bumps here and there, but they have in increased up to 2015. I'm going to give you a very short overview of Portuguese education. We have to consider authoritarian times, obviously up to 74. Then we entered what I call a romantic era in which people would like, or everybody would like to study, uh, everybody would like to um, abolish exams, just have a good time, and uh, of course learning at the same time, but uh, in a very romantic way. So people were not assessing correctly what was going on, people were not um, having a, a very strict curriculum, a very organized curriculum and so on. But in 2000, and 2000, 2001, 2003, a couple of things changed and they were prompted by the results in international assessments. So we entered what I call pragmatic times. So people were doing pragmatic change. They were looking at the results. 2011, 2015, which I know much better than all the other periods, of course, is the period I call knowledge curriculum because we were stressing 
the curriculum on knowledge and not on competencies or other areas. Uh, and now we have 2016 and what comes next. But let me start by telling you that in 1995, the fourth grade teams in math, Portugal had only two countries below. And two countries were not, a, not very successful countries in terms of education. And our grade was, for our points, we had, we were scoring 475 points. But in 2015, we scored 441 points and we had 36 countries below us. And including here, Finland, which we know it's still a powerhouse in terms of education, although it has been declining for, for the recent years, since 2006 approximately. But to pass over Finland was quite a success for us, and uh, this surprised many people. So we really changed things after 95 because of teams, uh, teams' results, and after 2000 because of PISA results. People were looking at the results and were saying, Oh my God, we have to improve. Oh my God, we have to improve. And so we have these pragmatic times where different ministers from different points of view, different parties, they all try to, um, to better the system, to make the system better by uh, paying more attention to the results. To I mean, the results of the students, obviously. Well, and now we arrived at, at 2015 where all this happens, all the progresses we had, we, we had, are progress that are made, of course, on average, but also significantly increasing the top and decreasing the bottom. I'll get back to this point later because I think it's a very important point. The dropout rates also dropped very fast. This is very impressive. Well, it's very impressive first and in 2000. So at the end of the 20th century, we had 43.6% uh, of dropout rates for youth, um, you know, this definition from 18 to 24 people that are not, that didn't finish high school and are not studying, we had 43.6 dropout, dropout, uh, dropouts, and that this was a very, very negative, but we improved very fast, as you can see over there. So all these improvements were improvements not only in mean, but also in terms of uh, helping the students that had uh, more problems that were struggling with their results. So we have two different countries. If I want to, to put the, the marks that are more important, I'd say that school results that were very, were released PISA in 2001 and teams before that, then we introduced evaluation at, um, at ninth grade. And then we had assessment at fourth and sixth grade and some action programs directed to mathematics and to, uh, the, to reading. Uh, I have many criticisms about these action programs that were put in place, but anyway, they had this uh, effect of concentrating the attention of people on the important things, and the important things at the beginning are, of course, reading and mathematic, mathematics. Then we had a textbook evaluation system put in place in 2007, which was very important. And in 2011, this is period I know better, obviously, we entered what I call knowledge curriculum. So this idea that the curriculum should be based on competence, on capacity to apply knowledge and uh, not paying so much attention to knowledge base that me is needed to apply knowledge uh, was put in place. So we ended competence and we introduced a knowledge based curriculum with standards and very clear standards. In 2012, we had better standards and then we had evaluation of four and six grades. These were very important marks in this progression here. But what happens next? We have to, as Tim was saying, we have to pay attention to the, the policy measures that were put in place at a certain moment and what happened with these policy measures. So what happened next is completely different. I'd say that we have competence again in 2016, after 2016 and look at the results in PISA. The results in PISA stalled or even decreased. So this is very clear that we had an increase and then we stalled and even decreased in PISA at the moment that the, the competence curriculum was again put in place and a more loose curriculum was put in place. I'm not going to enter into criticisms of the, the current policy 
uh, current policy in Portugal, but it's very important to stress that the current policy has nothing to do with the policy that made us improve along all these years. Now, I'm going back to that dichotomy between quality and fairness that many people think exists. Well, it may exist, but it's a wrong dichotomy. We have to uh, avoid it and we can improve both the low end and the upper end students, uh, of students. So let's have a closer look of what we were able to do and we, what we were able to do with this more strict curriculum, with this more uh, better attention to results, we were one of the few countries, very few countries, that were able simultaneously to decrease the share of low performers and to increase the share of high performers. So we can do both things at the same time. Portugal, according to, to PISA, PISA uh, report, this is a, a graph from the PISA report, significantly increased the share of top performers and decreased the share of low performers, which I think it's a very important, uh, very important thing to do. And it's possible to do simultaneously. This is what I can call a positive reduction of inequalities because we are not only, we are improving everybody. Uh, if we look at other, other indicators about these dropout rates, I, I talked about it. And you see that dropout rates decreased very fast since the beginning of the century and they increased. Look at this data that I, I've put up before and now look at this steep decrease. And this steep decrease corresponds exactly to the period, pragmatic times and knowledge-based curriculum times. I'm going to call your attention to a, a graph here, to a table here that I think it's real, real, really, really important. This, this table here uh, shows the, sh the share of low performers at OECD in Portugal and in the uh, European Union. Look at this. So we look at OECD and we see that the share of low performers is increasing in science, is increasing not so much, but it's increasing in, in uh, math, and it's increasing a little bit in reading. So in, at OECD, the share of low performers is increasing, which is very worrisome. Look at Portugal. In Portugal, we have the share of low performers increasing a bit and then decreasing. Increasing a bit, then decreasing. Increasing the reading, increasing a bit, then decreasing. So look, this is 2015. This is the year after the program of, of a very clear program for a uh, strict curriculum, a very organized curriculum, a demanding curriculum and assessment, continuous assessment. So look that we were able to decrease the share of low performers. What happened next is that the share of low performers didn't continue this, this, this decrease. You see this here? Now the European Union, it's also very, very worrisome because look, in both in, in, in all areas, science, math and reading, look, the share of low performers is increasing. So this means that this is getting worse here. It has been getting better in Portugal and in some other countries. What I think is more or less what I put in the title of this presentation is that the curriculum is very, very important. And I, in five topics, I'm going to uh, tell you what we did and what I think it needs to be done this way or similar way in education. Well, first we have to have a demanding curriculum centered on the essential subjects, structured, progressive and detailed and have detailed standards. So we not, not only need to tell students, oh, or to tell the schools, we need to know something about polynomials. We have to say you have to be able to multiply polynomials of this degree. You have to be able to, to divide polynomials of these degrees and so on and so on. It has to be structured, progressive and detailed. The standards have to be. At the basis, 
its knowledge. Everybody discusses, or many people discuss, what shall we do? Should we be concerned about the application of knowledge? Should we be concerned about skills? We have to be concerned with everything. We have to be concerned with knowledge. We have to be concerned with skills. We have to be concerned with attitudes. We have to be concerned with values. We want to develop in students all these, uh, these, um, these aspects, but at the base, we need knowledge. If we just look at skills without knowledge, if you look at attitudes without knowledge, if we don't have knowledge at the base, we can progress. Then we need frequent assessment. We did it for fourth, sixth, ninth, and twelfth grades, and we need to have some kind of in comparison of international, inter internal, and external ass assessments. Evaluation is an incentive to learn. Evaluation is a measure that can tell you how you are progressing. Evaluation is absolutely necessary. Evaluation is not something done on the side of learning. Evaluation is something that is an in, in, intrinsic part of learning and intrinsic part of knowing the system and getting better system better. Then, of course, we have to, to be worried about the students that are failing, about the students that have to have difficulties. And the, the, the dilemma is not protect these and lower the standards or have high standards and help the, the, the better performing students. No, this is a false dilemma. What we need to do is we need to have high standards and try to get everybody to these high standards. But of course, we know that some people will have some difficulties, so we need to, inter to have an inter a systematic intervention as the first difficulties. We may have special hours for struggling students. We, must have, we may have temporary groupings, which is not the same thing as tracking or uh, in um, uh, streaming, as you uh, say in the UK. It's not the same thing. It's temporary groupings to help these students to reach the level, the average level. So, and everybody can reach a reasonable level. I think this is uh, something that we should uh, take from the beginning. Of course, we need school autonomy. This represents different things in different countries. We did it by giving credits to school to support students with difficulties, incentives based on the progress and based on the alignment with the internal and external evaluation. And this is the only way to give freedom to schools, to give freedom of processes, is to evaluate results and say, this is where we want to go. So please see, let's see what you are doing and do it the way you think it's better appropriate. We need to have alternate paths. We need vocational paths in middle school and in high school. And uh, this is a completely, uh, com a very interesting discussion, but I think that uh, we have to um, move on, but this is an important part of improving education. I'll stress that everything starts with the curriculum again. So my point at the title of this, uh, this short talk was this one. I thank again Cambridge Assessment. My university and my school have been supporting me throughout all these years. Teresa El Santos Soares Santos Iniciativa Educação is a new project I'm involved with. I, it, it has an, an English uh, site, so please go there and see what we are doing. And if you want to contact me, this is my uh, website and my um, Twitter is my name, obviously, but reversed. I don't know why. I don't remember. I only have two more words. Thank you. Thank you, really. Nunu, thank you very much. And you, you've you've covered a huge area in in very very short time. Um, and and we we've got some questions that I'd like to um, put to you. And and perhaps the the speed and and the brevity of your presentation made made some of the things that you said seem uncontroversial when in fact they are quite contested. I think one of the contested things is this issue of, of the opportunity to improve both um, equity and attainment. I mean, this is quite remarkable. Um, and it, it, it is something which Eric Hanischek has written about in the States as being possible, but not frequently attained. 
that that's one thing and i'll mention a couple more things and then and then go to some of the questions um i think you mentioned uh, the importance of um of, of, of clear standards but that they should be structured progressive and detailed and again that sounds uh, very straightforward and yet that's not not achieved in quite a lot of national curricula um and and i think what what you emphasize as as being the principles that you were using at the time uh, the time which seems to coincide with the later appearance of high of improvement is, is what Bill refers to as uh, Bill Schmidt refers to as focus, rigor, and coherence. You have to know what it is and state with precision what the outcomes are that you want. You you have to make sure that each and every child is actually achieving them and take action if they're not. And the various aspects of curriculum, instruction, materials, aims, that and so on, all have to be aligned, and and pull professionals in a similar direction. But the, these these mar, whilst perhaps seeming self-evident for your presentation, are highly contested. Do you want to, to just reflect on that? Um, do you want me to, to, to talk now, Tim, or do you want, Tim, yes, or do you want you can, to, you, to wait for some more questions? That's well, fine, if, that's fine. Well, I, yeah, yes, if you just reflect on that, and then I'll, I'll give you two or three on more the questions. Standards, on the standards and on the, the equity and attainment, right? Yes. OK, well, um, this is controversial. Actually, this is controversial because many people think that we don't need standards, that standard, standards are a kind of um, prison, that we don't need structure. Structure is a kind of a prison and um, we don't need a clear progression. And if we just think about a couple of uh, exaggerations that have been uh, fashionable nowadays, such as the project, the project method and uh, the um, uh, curricular flexibility and so on. If you think about the uh, the child discovery, um, if you think about it, and of course, in anything there are good things. We can always say, oh, there is a good thing here in this idea of having a project. But the problem is not to have a project. The, pro the pro problem is how should we lead education? Should we lead education through loose projects that children could could choose the way they want, or should should we lead education through structured ideas so that we cover the maximum amount of topics and we we have the, the better possible training for students? And my answer is the second one: we should do a training, a very organized training. Kids stay in school nowadays at 12 years or or something around it, and these 12 years have to be profitable for them. They have to lose the school with the better knowledge they can, with the better training they can, with better developed skills, with better attitudes, the better, the better uh, principles that they can. And this it has to be guided. And the only way to guide this is to have goals. This is what happens everywhere in life. We need goals. If we don't have goals and we just say, oh, we are going to do a couple of activities, we are going to have a, to do a couple of projects and we don't have goals, that we don't attain what is needed for these students to progress. So again, I'm not against doing a project. I'm not going against of having ch children explore by themselves a couple of subjects. What I'm against is not to have clear standards, clear goals or, 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 or on what we want to achieve. Now, the equity and the attainment, it's really a very, uh, very strange thing for me because as a statistician, I always think about average and, um, and standard deviation. Let's say we all always have these two things. And so to just say, oh, I want, a, I want to, re to have um, a, a smaller standard deviation. It doesn't make any sense if we want to have a smaller standard deviation and decrease the mean. So what we want, of course, is to have a smaller standard deviation, but to increase the mean, not to decrease the mean. And we have in our book two or three examples um, of countries and areas in which some countries were able to reduce the inequalities, but harming all students. So all students got worse. And so the inequalities were smaller, but all students hadn't had the better 
hadn't had the same uh, possibilities to improve their 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 uh, their knowledge. And other countries in which the, the qualities were reduced in a positive way. So I say that there is a negative way of reducing inequalities and a positive way of doing it. And we have to look not only at the inequalities, but at the average where we want to go. And and question the questions that are coming in are focusing very much on, on these key aspects of, of what you have presented this morning. Uh, I mean, one question here is, do you think that primary level national summative assessments are an essential element of educational improvement? That there is a rhetoric that, that we overassess in a number of systems, um, but that there is a failure to recognise that, for example, in Finland, in primary, where people argue, well, there are no national assessments. In, in Finland, that's an awful, there is a, a very high use of formal tests in primary by teachers to identify students who are at risk of falling behind. And I think you, you've highlighted this morning that we shouldn't lapse into this, this too much assessment rhetoric. You've got to say, well, what are the purposes of assessment? What, what are you using it for in your education system? Do you want to comment on this? Are, are primary level at national assessments an essential element of educational improvement? Oh, thank you, Tim. I, th I, I agree with you. I agree this is an, uh, an, um, a very important part of the progress of students at the elementary level as well. So we have um, external assessments at fourth and at sixth grade uh, because of a peculiarity of the Portuguese system. If uh, the system were different, maybe we will have just one formal assessment or standard assessment at fifth grade or sixth grade if the system were different. But we have these two. And these two are what I call low, not, not low stakes, but medium stakes assessment. So we have low stake, we have a combination of assessment tools, obviously. We have assessment that teachers are doing in school and that teachers should communicate amongst themselves and say, oh, my students are progressing this way, your students are progressing that way. What can I do? What can you do? We have this type of assessment that is going on almost daily in schools. Then we have some summative assessments, internal sum summative assessments that teachers do by themselves in their schools once a term or something like that with their students. And there is no harm in doing it in elementary school. I don't see any harm in doing it. And we have then the standardized assessments. These are the most controversial ones, but I feel I don't want to to say this in a universal way because different countries may have different systems. But for our system, I think that the standardized assessment that I call medium stakes assessment, a standardized assessment at the end of elementary school was essential. Was essential because it made everything being aligned. If you do just your assessment as a teacher, and if you don't have clear standards and a clear assessment you can confront with at general level, at national level, and regional level, whatever, if we don't have it, you are just always guessing what should be the right level. So I think that, and you as parent or you as a public a public administrator, you have to know what's going on in schools with an independent, an independent view. So I think this is absolutely essential. We have, of course, to be moderate. We have to, to be to be calm about it. We don't want to 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 over overdo it and no one wants to overdo it what the question is what is to overdo to overdo <laughs> could be to have exams like military exams at the end of sixth grade i think this is would be ridiculous but to have some type of assessment standardized assessment it's just a way of putting all the system in in the same line um i have to i'm sorry tim if i can i'll, I'll go back to tim's results tim's results we improved a lot from 2011 to 2015, fourth grade. Now, these were the students that entered school in 2011 and had their assessment at 2015. So these were the students that had more time to math and, and, uh, and uh, reading. These were the students that had a more clear uh, program. These were the students that had at the end of their of this this cycle, this four year cycle, have exams and they knew they will have an exam. And these students went over very, uh, very well placed countries. So 
in 2015, we really improved a lot. And this is a very clear improvement because there are things that we can say, oh, they need to be prepared. This is due to seven years ago when they were in elementary school. Now they are in high school. No, these are students that entered school in 2011 and left school in 2015. Within two weeks, we are going to know what happened to students that entered school in 2015 and left in 2019, because we are going to have another team's assessment for fourth grade. And really, we should look at it and take lessons from it. Mm. Whatever the results are, we should take lessons from it. Well, that's, that's extremely helpful. The um, You mentioned, I think I, I like your labels, you know, the romantic period and then uh, more recently, uh, the curriculum motivated by competence-based um, views of attainment and young people. I think there is a link between the two, by the way, in terms of a kind of romantic concept of the learner. Um, but but I, I re you and I recently discussed a paper by um, Catherine anderson Levitt on the way in which um, the rhetoric around competence-based curricula are building up around the world. Um, and, and a key question that's come in is, does the OECD's advocacy of a competency-based curricula contradict the evidence of what seems to improve performance in PISA? And it certainly does for me when I look at uh, around the, at the nations that are improving. Estonia, by the way, is often called a, 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 an example of an effective implementation of a competence-based curriculum. But that's only said, I think, by people who haven't looked at the national curriculum for Estonia, which emphasises things like memorisation of multiplication tables at the age of eight and nine. So I, I, I think, could, can you comment on this? Does the OECD's advocacy of competence-based curricula contradict the evidence of what seems to improve performance in PISA? Oh, um, well, do you want, I don't, I don't know, I'm not a musician, but I tried to learn piano some time ago. And my, my goal was to be able to play Beethoven sonatas. But where did I start? I skated. I didn't arrive there yet because I, <laughs> I paused. But we need to do scales in order to be able later to, to play Beethoven sonatas for piano. And the same thing happens with many things. And we can evaluate competencies. Can Let's say we can evaluate knowledge in action. We can evaluate the application of knowledge. But the funny thing is that the countries that concentrate on knowledge instead of concentrating on the application of knowledge are those that make do better on the application of knowledge. Mm. So we have to understand this cycle because kids have to kids have to start with basic things and we have to concentrate on these basic things and not and these things need to be learned because we know that they are going to be applicable and they are going to be applied in, in many cases. So we don't need we, we shouldn't start by the end, competence are the end, or skills are the end. And what we now know is that we know from scientific studies, from cognitive psychology, from economics of education, from, from P even PISA, PISA studies, is that the countries that do better are the countries that have a more direct approach to teaching and a more direct approach in their, in the, a more structured approach in their curriculum. And I, I think this is really important because we, we've seen, we've we've often seen an overstatement of of new understandings of education, um, in in order to try to for the advocates of that position to gain purchase. And I think we've seen that with this this very sterile debate in terms of knowledge based versus competence based. Um, the way it's occurring in the literature, the way it's occurring in at policy levels, I believe is far too oppositional and, and therefore um, does not appreciate the nuances which you're describing in terms of the way in which human performance is composed. Um, the next question, Nuno, is, is slight, takes a slightly different tack, but um, the, the, there is concern about what the impact of, of just having PISA actually is and what it has been. And so do you, do you think the PISA effect on national education policy is detrimental and gets in the way of providing broad and balanced curricula? It, it, it is, it's a complex question because there, there is a view that PISA itself has an impact 
that it's been appropriated into public policy in certain ways uh, and it's, that it's, it's stimulated uh, certain educational debates which are not entirely balanced and the question really looks to see whether whether that actually impacts on the provision of broad and balanced curricula. Okay, uh, it's a very complex question, that's correct. But if we look 20 years ago, if you look 20 years ago in my country, to have teams and to have PISA was essential, was really uh, instrumental. Without that, we wouldn't have the positive changes that followed because we suddenly realized that we were in bad shape in educational terms. I still have collections of public declarations of very respectable person, people saying, "Oh, um, we we are some of we have some of the best educational systems in the world. We our kids are very well prepared, and so on." And we look at data then when we had the data. So when we had Teams results and we had uh, PISA results, and the data forced us to rethink the system and to pay attention to results. I think this was very positive. Now, I still think that PISA and uh, Teams, Teams has some advantages because Teams is tries to, to answer to the achievement of the curriculum of each country. So in a kind of a kind of um, a way that is a kind of mix of various countries, but goes to the essential of the curriculum. But both teams in PISA are measuring what happens. And it's very detrimental if we if you just think, let's prepare for PISA. And so if we are going to prepare for PISA, we are going to prepare for questions that are the application of knowledge. And so instead of knowing arithmetic, for instance, you start looking at just at problems and then you go back to arithmetic. That's not the right way to do, but it's not the efficient way to do. So the best way to have a good results in PISA is to concentrate on knowledge. And then I say knowledge, I say knowledge, then application of knowledge, then training on knowledge, then skills, all these type of things, but it's to concentrate on the basis. That's the best way to get a bet better results at PISA. If we do the opposite, we don't get good results at PISA. And if you, if you go, if you go for the, if you if you go even to to for instance 2015 PISA report and you see what is the best way to teach and to teach uh, sciences because that PISA report was was centered on science that PISA wave was centered on science and they didn't repeat this type of study for this last PISA but and they did and they they approached they they have. Um, a couple of questions: How the teachers teach? How? What's the approach to 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 convey scientific ideas and so on and so on? And if you look at it, there are two graphs that are very interesting. And you you look at it and you say, oh, the countries that have a more direct approach, a more um, ambitious approach. So with teachers explaining the concept, teaching teachers testing the concepts on the on the students. The countries that had this approach were the countries that were most successful in answering competence in sciences. This looks like a contradiction, but it's like I'm going again to the Sonata and to the scales example. If you don't start with Sonata, start by learning a little, learning the notes, learning scales and so on. That's what you need to do. It's not as exciting maybe, but it's the, the way to go. And to be, I don't know if it's not that exciting because we have a, a very uh, romantic view many times about what kids like and what kids don't like. And we think, oh, kids don't like things that they don't apply. That's not true. That's absolutely false. People like things that they don't apply. They like science fiction. They like novels. They like things that they don't apply. And kids the same. What kids don't like is to fail. Kids like to have success on what they are learning. We don't need to tell them, oh, two plus two is four is important to know because if you have two, two chairs and two chairs, you have will have four chairs. We don't need to tell them that, this. And then we, what are we going to do with four plus three? And, and all, are we going to give examples for everything? No, we don't need to do that. We need to, to uh, train them, to impart knowledge on them so that they can have success. And kids love to have success at abstract things and things that are not thought of with immediate applications. 
And I and I think that, that that's that's one thing which is actually critical. That's one thing which is critical about understanding the question which is, was put about the impact of PISA. The impact has become complex. I mean, that we 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 say I mean, we we absolutely use the the Tim's and Pearls and PISA data in Cambridge. We see them as valuable, but we see them all, also as partial and specific. Your your point about the specificity of standards applies to the PISA items, doesn't it? I mean, they have a test specification that there is a theory behind each item. And, and in some cases, the theory, as you said, tends to emphasize a particular understanding of discipline areas. Uh, Eckhart Klemer in, in, in Germany and in DIPF also corroborates what you say, which is actually one of the best predictors of the of high outcomes in the applied mathematics problems within PISA is good underpinning formal mathematical knowledge. But but this is somewhat at odds with some of the rhetoric which then comes or, or some of the interpretative um, accounts which come on, on on the top of the PISA data. So I, th I think we do we do have to approach it very critically in the way in which you're implying and in the way in which the question implies. But but now now turning very much to your domestic context because it's so valuable to have you here today talking about the the, re the historical realities of what happened in Portugal. There's a question in terms of what was the mix of policies and community support that helped to de decrease dropout rates in Portugal. But I mean, there's also I think um, quite controversially. Um, in, in the minds of some educational researchers, you do have retention in grade, don't you, in Portugal? And that was one of one of the things which um, was very clear in your presentation, which I attended in Lisbon about four years ago, the way in which uh, retention rates w w was actually a critical part of interpreting the effectiveness of the policies. So what was the mix of policies, community support that helped to decrease dropout rates? Well, uh, that's really a difficult question because it's very difficult to measure. It's something that these are the type of changes that take decades to, to, to be felt. So, and we have to look at everything. We have to look at the education of parents and people, people look at that uh, very closely and they, re they see that the, the higher the education of the parents, the better uh, the expectations on the kids and so on. And all that has been improving a lot recently. We have to look at the preparation of students. That's a crucial thing. If students are not prepared, if students are just struggling with everything, they don't want to pursue their, stu their, their studies. They want to, to drop out. They want to get, to get out of school. So, and the best way, again, the best way to have kids like school is to have success in school. And the best way to have success in school is to, to, to impart that, to convey knowledge to them and to develop skills so that they can, they can uh, have a good preparation for next level. So for this, we need a curriculum, we need a structured, a structured curriculum. Also, the fact that we introduced some vocational paths for high school was also very, very important. We even did, uh, introduced vocational pathways for uh, middle school, for late middle school, because some kids were just repeating, repeating, or being re retained in being retained they were not progressing and the moment they were giving an alternative and they saw something they saw some light at the end of their studies they adhered to it they they joined it so it's a mix of things it's very difficult to to talk about all of them now about retention this is really an important thing of course no one wants to have retention and the way this is discussed usually is retention doesn't improve a student and I sustain that this is wrong way of putting things. I'm not concerned with retention is not the best way of, of helping a particular student. The real question is this, are we better off as a system if we just tell everybody no one is going to be retained, you are all going to pass until the end of your studies? Or if we have some assessment, some high stakes assessment along the way. And I think the best thing is the second one, the first one doesn't work and this second one of course has some pains and will have some retention re retention but this retention is maybe and should be um, just marginal just just uh, the attrition should be really very very small and we can do it if we support students at the same time evaluate them and i think that's that mix that every country 
uh, in different ways is trying to do or should try to do. And and that that's really important. It's really important in terms of in, it's really important in terms of inter interpreting the historical data, because in as I understand uh, the, the the history of the period that we're talking about, with the with the peaks and uh, declines being absolutely critical in terms of linking the timing of those to the policy. You after you had implemented the policies, there was an increase in retention rates, but the increase then dropped back to the previous levels exactly. but with higher with higher overall attainment for all. And exactly. this is absolutely central to understanding this historical trajectory, is it not? Yes, yes. I wish I was sufficiently proficient with this technology to show you a graph right now about this. But the, the essential thing is what you are describing. So we introduced a couple of exams and the moment we introduced the exams, the retention uh, increased on the, those particular years. But just after that, the, the, the retention decreased again and got back to the previous levels or even to lower levels. And this is very important because we have to look, we have to be confident about the policies. We have to look at the policy and see the, the effect is not immediate. It's not this year, but it's next year. And next year we started seeing it because the moment people saw, oh, this, we have this exam. This is something that is setting a standard. We have to pass over this standard. The moment this happens, the very year this happens, this happened, the retentions increased. Next year, they decreased again. And the important thing is that at the end, we had people that had lower retention than before, but higher, higher levels of knowledge, higher, higher levels of preparation for next studies, for next year studies and for life. And I think this is really a, a very, um, how do you say, promising. It's very rewarding to see this, to see that the, if the introduction of high stakes exams at a, some particular some particular moments does not increase retention, but improves students, improves mm -hmm. education as a whole. Excellent. Uh, Nunu, we have about seven minutes to go. Um, got about seven minutes to go until the end of the seminar. Um, and I'm, I'm, if we can just quickly respond to a couple of questions and then also um, we, we're going to encourage people to continue to submit questions and we can actually respond to, to those through personal email and also put them up on the Cambridge Assessment Network website. Um, so a couple of linked things. Did these policy measures in effect narrow the focus of the national curriculum? And, and was the improvement program coupled with large financial investment in the state education system? Well, let me start with the last one because it's easier uh, to answer. No, no, and a misunderstanding usually in terms of when we are discussing when we are discussing an education is that people always think we have to invest more on, on education and everybody agrees. Oh, yeah, we have to invest more. But what does it mean? Does it mean more money? That's what people think. Oh, we need more money. We need um, we need a, a better schedule. We need more students. We need more support to psychology. We need this. We need that. All these things could be needed. I'm not saying they are not needed, but the essential thing is not that. The essential thing regarding education for countries, European countries, and countries that have passed a certain threshold is not money. The essential thing is to have focus and to have a good program and to have good teachers and to to, to have clear goals. Now, the first question, uh, team, sorry, what was the first question? Oh, in terms of, of whether whether the, the kind of focus policy you described oh, yes, yes, actually yes. resulted in a narrowing of the national yeah. curriculum. Uh, look, if we focused on the first elementary school on reading and mathematics, and of course, we have if we have some arts, if we have physical education, if we have a couple of things, but if we concentrate on on reading and mathematics, are we um, are we narrowing the curriculum? I don't think so. I don't think so. Kids need arts, need activities, need lots of things. Need, but they if they don't succeed at reading and at basic arithmetic and basic arithmetic and basic geometry they wouldn't have success. So let's for elementary education. Then we have all the other all the other areas that are branching after elementary education. 
And I don't, again, I don't think that the fact that we say, let's evaluate, let's let's concentrate on the basis is going to narrowing, narrow curriculum. What I'm seeing is the opposite, is that when people start trying to have many, many, many things in the curriculum, many, many, many things, what happens is that students are not good at any. And we need students to be good at many things, but uh, it, paying more attention to those that are essential and the essentials I'd say it's Portuguese, it's math, or Portuguese in my case, of course, it's, it's reading, it's mathematics, it's uh, it's sciences, it's languages, it's English, it's, um, it's geography, it's history, it's all these things and these things can not be thought as a, a narrow curriculum. These things are the basic for 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 life and of course we have to have um, variety and we have to allow for some variety within schools, but respecting these basic things and we have to succeed on these basic things. And I think that that's very important, this issue of um, the the distinction between a national curriculum and the school curriculum and the, ex the extent to which the state's responsibility is, is to specify with clarity the core, which is vital for all young people and for citizens and then I completely there will, agree. Yeah. There will, there will I completely be elaboration at the school level um, and we see we see this in many systems. It's also true that that um, Reynolds and Farrell's 1986 finding remains true that primary systems that have pursue fewer things in greater depth have um, far better outcomes overall, better equity and better progression and, and often having a more focused curriculum in primary enables a more elaborated curriculum in secondary. Um, and and the, the, these are these are essential learnings from transnational study. Uh, there are a couple more questions, but but I think we need to close here. Um, it, it's been a, a great opportunity actually to hear uh, an inside story of, of educational innovation and reform from a person who was inside it, central to it, um, and an architect of it, its direction. So you know it inside out with authenticity. You, you've backed up that story, that narrative of your experience with reference to these large bodies of transnational evidence. And it's help, helped us to understand how we should interpret those bodies of evidence as well as um, getting getting real insights into your own situation within Portugal. So I'd like to say thank you, Nuno. It's been it's been great to have you uh, as part of the the network series. You've been preceded by some very eminent speakers um, in o over the past few years, and um, it will be great to have this as part of our our lecture series. The insights, I think, stand for a long time. They, they, are, they are general insights into curriculum development, public policy, and the interpretation of transnational data. So it's been of huge value, and, and I've enjoyed it greatly, and I hope participants have too. Um, it's been quite smooth, hasn't it? But it's always yes. it's always quite fraught and always quite quite tense running these things <laughs> remotely. But it's worked flawlessly. So I, I want to lend thanks to to Penelope and to Stuart particularly and to Jonathan for actually enabling this to happen and happen so smoothly. So thank you so much. And, and Nuno, it was good that you plugged the book and it was good that the book arrived today in terms of a copy. Yes. It's one that we need to give to ministers to help them to understand. So, so Nunu, thank you so much. It's been a great oh, thank you. To you today. Thank you, Tim. It was just a great honor for me to be here with you, and it's a great honor to be a, to be friends. So, um, and I enjoyed very much this discussion, and I hope we, we keep discussing these things because they are essential for the future of our country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Nunu. We'll speak soon. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>